Hello and welcome to Grand Cayman. I'm Martin Sutton and I've been diving in the waters of the Caribbean for 15 years. And I've also had the pleasure of introducing thousands of divers to the joys of underwater photography. And believe me, these crystal clear waters are the place to do it. Our nearby walls and reefs are abundant with marine life and quite a few fish that love to pose for divers. Over the years, we've developed techniques that enable our divers to return with clear, bright images that dazzle their friends back home. Recently, we began to put our teaching methods onto video so that underwater photo enthusiasts could improve their techniques using our camera of choice, the Nikonis 5. Our first video, Basic Underwater Photography with the Nikonis 5, presented an overview of the Nikonis 5 system and a review of the fundamentals of basic underwater photography. If you haven't seen this tape, we recommend that you view it before you begin your advanced lessons. This is especially important if you're a relatively new underwater photographer. We'll be referring to a lot of technical items that may be confusing without the foundation of fundamentals that we laid on the first video. Our second video, Advanced Underwater Photography Macro and Close-Up, explored the techniques used to capture what many consider to be the most dramatic, yet easiest form of underwater photography. On this, our third tape, we'll be discussing wide angle, and we'll introduce you to the equipment needed, review the techniques of wide angle, and go on an underwater photo expedition, showing you a step-by-step -step how to session, shooting the best pictures. During this how-to session, we'll utilize some of my favorite shots taken in the Red Sea, the South Pacific, and the Caribbean. Since many of the wide-angle shots you'll want to get involve other divers in your frame, we'll conclude this program with a special section on working with models underwater. It's only fair to ask at this point, why wide angle? Part of that answer is obvious. Since there are so many things to see underwater, you often want to get a wider shot than that which your standard lens can deliver. But most of the time, if you back off to get the wider shot, it puts too much water and therefore too many suspended particles between you and your subject. When that happens, your strobe becomes ineffective and the shot is ruined or not lit properly your subjects produce fuzzy, indistinct images. Shooting with a wide-angle lens allows you to get so much more in your shot than a standard lens would from the same distance. Note, in this picture of a diver, taken first with a standard and then a wide-angle lens. A standard lens shows only the head and shoulders of the diver. The wide-angle, at the same distance, shows much more, including the fish which would have been excluded in standard. Another advantage of shooting wide angle is the tremendous depth of field. With this deep depth of field, virtually everything is in focus, so the wide angle lens can be used to shoot pictures such as these, with dramatic foreground and background subjects, both of which are in focus. Wide angle also enables you to use forced perspective in your shots, a technique we'll be discussing that you can really have a lot of fun with. And wide angle can even be used to shoot close-ups. The thing I like best about wide angle is that it lets the artist in you come out creating images that a standard lens could not have seen. And it offers flexibility which allows you to become the director, controlling what is included and not included in the shot and how it is to be framed. Let's talk about the equipment you'll need. Unlike macro and close-up photography which require only a modest investment in additional equipment, Wide angle requires a bit more of a financial commitment. Wide angle lenses come in several focal lengths, but the two manufactured by Nikon are the most common, so we'll be using those for our discussions. They are the 20mm lens, which is easy to use and excellent for portraits, and the 15mm lens, Nikon's premier underwater lens and the workhorse of professional underwater photographers around the world. Since the Nikonos 5 is not a single lens reflex camera, your existing viewfinder, which is designed for the 35 or 28mm lenses, can't be used to compose images accurately. 
and will only be used to view the LEDs of the built-in light meter. Each of the wide-angle lenses is used with a matching optical viewfinder made specifically for its focal length and which screws onto the accessory shoe with a knurled nut. If you buy a 20mm wide-angle lens, you'll need a 20mm optical viewfinder. When you take it out of the box for the first time, you'll notice a 28mm mask on the viewfinder. This viewfinder enlarges the viewing area for the 28mm lens. With the mask removed, the viewfinder is designed for the 20mm. If you bought a 15mm lens, you'd need a matching 15mm optical viewfinder. Both of these viewfinders are clearly marked for easy identification. Since these lenses and viewfinders are corrected for underwater use, don't be surprised if you look through them out of the water and the images appear to be blurry. They're not broken. The first time you look through them underwater, you'll see clearly. The front elements of both lenses are domed front optical elements, which correct wide-angle lenses for use underwater and make them easily identifiable as wide-angle lenses. When you begin to work with your wide-angle lens, you'll find the 15mm and the 20mm have a much greater angle of view than you used to with the 35mm lens at the same camera to subject distance. The 35mm lens has an angle of view of 43 degrees or about what you see on land with your eyes. The 20mm has a greatly increased angle of view of 78 degrees, almost double that of the 35mm lens. The 15mm has an angle of view of an extraordinary 94 degrees. Another obvious difference you'll notice, not only between your 28 or 35 and the wide angles, but even between the wide angles themselves, is the placement of the focus indicators and the f-stop indicators. You're used to seeing both of these indicators by looking into the face of the lens. On the 20mm, the indicators for both f-stop and distance are on the controller arms. If you mount the lens in the standard way, as we turn the arm on the right side, you'll see the f-stop markings roll past the indicator etching. As you turn the arm on the left side, you'll see the focus distances roll past the indicator etching. The 20mm will focus down to a minimum distance of 1.3 feet. You'll also notice that the f-stops are color-coded. For example, f5.6 is orange, f8 is white, and f11 is red. These colors correspond with the etchings on the focus distance dial and indicate the depth of field. As we can see in this example, if our iris is set to f5.6 and the distance set to 3 feet, the corresponding orange etchings on the focus dial indicate depth of field from 2 to 5 feet. At the same distance of 3 feet, with the f-stop set to f11, the red etchings, the depth of field will be from 1.6 feet to infinity. The widest aperture on the 20mm is f2.8. This Nikon 20mm is an excellent wide-angle lens which will enable you to duplicate many of the pictures we've already shown you. But perhaps the Rolls-Royce of the wide-angle line is the 15mm, a lens which yields superb pictures of astounding sharpness. The 15mm is a little bit larger than the 20, again with a domed port and a matching viewfinder. The control dials for both the focus and f-stop are located on the same side of the lens whilst the indicators are found under a glass port on the barrel. The indicator mark is a tiny black line which many people find hard to see. We recommend that you place two pieces of waterproof tape on either side of the glass port and draw two black arrows to help you determine your correct focus and f-stop positions. Notice that the 15mm will focus down to a minimum distance of 9 inches so it's great for wide-angle close-ups. Like the 20mm, your widest aperture is f2.8. The 15mm has tremendous depth of field. For example, if you're shooting at f11, with your focus set to 2 feet, 
your depth of field extends from 1.1 feet all the way to infinity. It is possible to shoot wider angle pitches than those which the 15 and 20 millimeter can offer, but to do so requires a special housing for your land camera and an extreme wide angle lens like the 16 millimeter full frame fisheye, which offers an angle of view of 170 degrees. However, photography with housings like this is a whole different kettle of fish, which we'll explore in a future tape. After you attach your 15 millimeter lens, starting with a silver knob in the vertical position, you'll want to attach your 15 millimeter optical viewfinder. Like the 20 millimeter, the 15 millimeter optical viewfinder slides into the accessory shoe on top of the camera and is held in place by a locking screw. Often, the viewfinders can become loose and slide from the accessory mount. For this reason, some photographers attach a lanyard that will connect the viewfinder to the camera. The viewfinder replicates fairly closely what your lens is seeing. I say fairly closely, since whenever you're not looking through a single lens reflex camera, there'll always be a slight parallax problem, especially when you're shooting subjects less than four feet away. Part of this parallax problem is corrected by the tilt of the viewfinder. But in both the 20 mm and 15 mm viewfinders, you should also use the parallax correction markings inside your viewfinder, which indicate the proper framing when shooting subjects less than four feet away. The next piece of equipment you'll want to consider is your strobe assembly. We recommend you use either the Nikon SB102 strobe or the SB103 strobe with a strobe diffuser. The diffuser broadens the area of the strobe to better cover the angle of view of your wide-angle lens. If you use a strobe with a narrow beam, the area surrounding your subject will fall off into blueness, as this picture shows. As the name implies, the strobe diffuser also softens the sometimes harsh light of the strobe and improves the color temperature of the light. So even though it's not necessary to use the diffuser if you're using a 102, you may want to use it to give your pictures a slightly warmer look. You may want to secure your diffuser with a short lanyard so as not to lose it. I really like the look the diffuser gives to all my shots, so I leave it on all the time. In fact, I just super glue mine into place. Some photographers graduate to the use of two strobes for extremely even corner-to-corner -corner illumination of their pictures. Although this may not always be necessary if we've included a lot of blue water in the shot, it becomes very important when the subject fills the frame. With this system, the Nikonus double bracket and double sink cord are used. Once we get underwater, you'll be taking advantage of the camera's TTL or through the lens metering system to control the strobe. And we can now preset the SB102 to TTL. Preset the camera mode selector dial to A for aperture priority and change the ASA ISO indicator to the appropriate film speed. We like to use a slow speed reversal or slide film. Don't forget to bring along lots of fresh batteries and film for that trip. Now let's take a moment to review what we've just learned. When using either a 15mm or 20mm wide-angle lens with a matched optical viewfinder and the proper wide-angle strobe set to TTL, the camera mode set to A will have greater depth of field, get superb coverage at relatively short distances, and be close enough for our strobe to be extremely effective. In our earlier tapes, we spent considerable time discussing how to best prepare for a dive, both prior to leaving home or resort and when you get on the boat. I recommend strongly that you review those sections to assure that you have a worry-free trip. Once you're on the boat and have unpacked your photo gear, go over your camera checklist. Wide-angle lens properly mounted, the right optical viewfinder, mounted correctly, film loaded, correct ISO ASA indicated, camera mode set to A, Strobe set to TTL, 
and strobe aimed correctly. As we've reminded you on each tape, you always have to keep safety foremost in mind. You can't let the excitement of the beautiful shots you're about to take distract you from paying close attention to all the safety rules and listening to your dive master's briefing. Good afternoon, everybody. The dive set we brought you to this afternoon is called Aquarium. It's one of the prettier dives on this side of the island. The profile I'm going to give you for this dive is a 50-foot maximum depth for 50 minutes. All right? We'd like everybody back on the boat with at least 500 pounds of air in your tank. And you should know where the boat is when you get to about 1,500 pounds or about 25 to 30 minutes into the dive. If you come to the surface to locate, locate the boat, just come up, give me a big OK. I'll return the signal, you continue your dive, drop back down, and try and be underneath the boat and you get about uh, 40 minutes into the dive or you're down to about 800 pounds of air. All right? That being said, now comes the fun part. At the bottom of the anchor line, go over your camera check one more time. As you leave the anchor line, it's a good idea to reflect on the responsibility that you have to the beautiful environment that you've just entered. Relatively few people will ever experience firsthand what you are about to. In exchange for this very special privilege, you must make every effort not to damage the delicate and fragile world you are visiting. Good diving etiquette and responsible environmental behavior dictate that you practice approved photo buoyancy control. These simple common sense measures include fin control to prevent turbulence and damage near the reef. Avoid touching live coral using only one hand or preferably one finger for balance. These simple measures can go a long way towards protecting our reefs without cramping your style as a diver or photographer. The thing I like best about wide angle is that it presents so many possibilities. With standard lenses, your composition was limited. Most of the time you centered up on the subject in the middle of the frame and fired away. You might as well have been shooting just mug shots. But with wide angle, you're much more in control and able to manipulate both the lens and the subject matter to render images which are a creative distortion of real life, sometimes almost surrealistic. You're also able to better direct the viewer's eye to where you want it to go by careful, selective composition. And because of the enormous depth of field, you're able to stack up your shots with two, three, even four layers of subject matter. When you pick up your camera underwater and look through the wide-angle optical viewfinder for the first time, you're able to see the lens and viewfinder work as they were designed to, underwater. Look through your viewfinder and practice composing shots before you start to shoot. You're going to notice that your frame area is a lot bigger than that which you've seen before, and it takes some getting used to. So when you do start to shoot, you're going to want to remember to fill up the frame with subject matter and check all of the corners of the frame to make sure that you're excluding and including exactly what you want to. You may decide to hand hold your strobe underwater, allowing you to produce different moods by changing the lighting angle. But be sure you don't hold it too close to the frame edge or you'll get flare. Or you may even see the strobe in the shot on the 15 mm lens. Don't shoot until your composition is set. Another one of the first things you'll notice as you look through the optical viewfinder is that the wide angle lens distorts reality. Subjects in the foreground appear disproportionately larger than they appear to the naked eye. And subjects in the background appear disproportionately smaller than they appear in real life. This phenomenon is inherent in wide-angle lenses, and you don't have to be underwater to observe it. It's called forced perspective. And you can use it to your artistic advantage if you remember it, or it can cause some absurd distortions if you don't. In this shot, the perspective looks rather normal 
both stingray and diver seem in proportion. But watch what happens when the diver's hand moves towards the wide-angle lens. It becomes disproportionately larger. Another way you can use this forced perspective to your advantage is to distort true life scale to add emphasis. Here we see a Napoleon wrasse from the Red Sea. The size of the fish is made larger by placing it in the foreground. The divers in the background are made disproportionately smaller, thereby making the fish look even bigger. The same thing is done with this diver portrait in Cayman. We place the tube sponge closer and the diver further away. Because viewers have a good idea of the size or scale of a human, placing a diver in wide-angle shots like these leads the viewer to compare the size of the primary subject to the diver and draw the conclusion that the primary subject is enormous. This partly explains why you see so many divers in wide-angle shots, a concept we'll mention again in just a moment. As we look at these shots closely, we see some other dynamics occurring. One thing you'll notice is that the diver is making eye contact with the subject and not with the camera. Our eye is initially drawn to the primary subject. We then look to the secondary subject, the diver. Her eye contact then draws us back to the primary subject just as it should. Too many times an interesting shot is made pedestrian when the diver is caught looking at the camera. This eye contact is extremely important and we'll be talking about it again in just a few minutes. Another principle we need to bear in mind is a rule of composition that dates back to the earliest works of art. It's called the rule of thirds. When using the 35mm normal lens, we simply centered up and clicked. But now we want to try something different. With the rule of thirds in our mind's eye, we want to divide the frame into thirds, first horizontally and then vertically. Think of it as a tic-tac-toe board. With a tic-tac-toe board in mind, you want to first place your primary subject in one of the four spots where the lines intersect. Usually, photographers will use one of the two bottom intersections. Then, using a diagonal line, situate your secondary subject in the opposite corner of your primary subject. This produces an elegant diagonal flow carrying the viewer's attention through the picture. Though this rule is the best way to lay out your shots, slight adaptions to it can also be successful. In this shot, there is no secondary subject along the diagonal, but the implied motion of the diver along the anchor line which leads to that point creates the rule of thirds. Here, the normal positions are reversed, but the rules still apply and the shot still works according to the rule of thirds. As you can see, the vast majority of the pictures I shoot in wide angle are shot in the vertical format. This will become critically important as you'll see in a moment. So you'll want to consider shooting the majority of your underwater wide angle shots in the vertical format with a strobe on top. Okay, let's try some portraits. At the end of this tape, we're going to have a special section on working with underwater models. But for now, let's talk about the more technical aspects of shooting underwater portraits. With underwater portraits, you'll want to accurately render the colors and details of the wetsuit, mask and other equipment and be able to distinguish the features of the diver. So you must place the diver no more than five feet away from the lens. Begin by placing the primary subject almost within touching distance and at one of the intersecting points of our rule of thirds. Place the diver behind the primary subject. Three to four feet is best. This way, the strobe is close enough to render the colors of both primary and secondary subject accurately. With your wide-angle lens, three to four feet is far enough away to get more than just a waist-up portrait. Have your model make eye contact with the primary subject and not with the camera. Our intention is to lead the viewer around the picture. We begin by drawing them to the primary subject and next, their eyes travel to the diver, who, by looking back at the primary subject, keeps the viewer involved in the picture.
all the principles we've discussed coalesce in a favorite type of mind that we've seen in every diver magazine or photo collection. It's what we call the distant diver shot. In the distant diver shot, we invariably see a primary subject in the lower third of the vertical frame lit by the strobe. In the opposite corner, we see a distant diver silhouetted against the surface which often includes the sun. If we analyze this photo carefully, we'll see four characteristics which make it interesting and which you should try to emulate in your own distant diver shots. Briefly, you want to shoot in the vertical format, aim your camera up at an acute upward angle, position your primary subject close to the lens, and position your diver against open blue water. Let's take a look at what happens when we apply all four guidelines. By shooting in the vertical format, you create a graduated background from light blue to dark blue, which suggests in the viewer's mind drama and depth. Depending upon the subject, a horizontal format often fails to create the same visual impact, showing simply a monochrome blue. Aim your camera up at an acute angle. The second point is an extension of the first. By aiming at an acute angle, you're able to incorporate all shades of blue, from very, very light to a dark blue. Even if you shot in the vertical format but didn't aim up, you'd fail to achieve the graduation we are looking for and get only one monotonous shade of blue. Next, position your primary subject close to the lens. We want that primary subject to dominate the shot and draw the viewer's eye. We do this by placing it close to the lens and using forced perspective to enlarge the size of the primary subject, allowing it to dominate the picture. And finally, position your diver against open blue water. By doing this, you separate the primary subject from the secondary subject. If the diver is too close to the primary subject, then she simply becomes an extension of the primary subject. The optimum distance to place the distant diver is between 10 and 15 feet. Forced perspective will make the diver look much further away. If your diver retreats further from the lens, they will eventually disappear. If your dive buddy is camera shy, you may want to follow the guidelines of the distant diver shot, but instead substitute your dive boat or perhaps a school of fish. For added excitement, you may decide to have your model carry a handheld slave strobe or video light. This will simulate a flashlight and add an extra point of interest to the picture. A regular underwater flashlight would usually not be strong enough to be picked up on the film. Pictures with a distant diver almost always elicit emotion from your audience. Some comment on the staggering beauty, some on the eerie quality they convey. With wide angle, once you know the principles of a distant diver, you're only limited by your imagination. Sometimes you'll want to shoot silhouettes. Silhouettes, by definition, are available light pictures, so we begin by turning off the strobe. Since you're not using your strobe now, you're not locked in to 1 90th of a second or slower. So, while you still leave the camera mode in the A or aperture priority position, you can change your shutter speed to between 1 1 25th of a second and 1 2 50th of a second to better freeze the action by changing your f-stop. Use the LED readouts in the viewfinder to determine the correct f-stop which will give you one of these shutter speeds. If these steps are confusing to you, you should review the first tape, Basic Underwater Photography. A silhouette of divers descending the anchor line from a boat is an excellent way to begin a slideshow. This shot combines principles of available light shooting and distant diver shooting for dramatic effect. Here, we use the forced perspective characteristics of the wide-angle lens and principles of available light to shoot an interesting cave opening shot. 
by positioning yourself behind a small opening in the coral and shooting your distant divers in silhouette, you can make this two-foot hole in the coral appear to be a gaping cave opening. Another wide-angle category which yields great results is what we call close-focus wide-angle. This shot takes advantage of the wide-angle lens' ability to focus extremely close, down to less than a foot on the 15 mm and 1.3 feet on the 20. A little like taking force perspective to the max. Relatively small subjects such as this tiny wheel on the wreck of the Oro Verde appear to swell in size, and because of the immense depth of field of the wide-angle lens, you'll be able to include a secondary subject in the background. If you want to try this close-focus wide-angle technique, one word of caution. Since you're so close to the subject, you're going to have to adjust for parallax correction. An easy way to do this begins with placing a target dot on the back of the camera. You'll see why in a moment. Turn your focus to minimum focus distance. Change your f-stop to f16 or f22. Aim your strobe for the closer distance. Move very close to your primary subject. Aim through the optical viewfinder, and then move the camera upwards approximately three inches, and make believe you're aiming through the target dot that you placed on the back of the camera. If you're shooting in the vertical format, the principles will remain the same, but remember to make sure that the strobe is on the top. This is not the most precise type of photography, and it's best to shoot several exposures to ensure proper composition. One of my favorite close focus wide angle shots was taken in the Red Sea. Two small clownfish nestled within the tentacles of an anemone. By moving the camera close to the anemone, the clownfish were exaggerated in size and made to dominate the picture. Though these fish were only perhaps one or two inches in length, forced perspective makes them appear much larger. The great depth of field allows the background reef and fish to still appear in focus. Though again, because of forced perspective, they appear very small. Another excellent opportunity for close focus was a school of squirrel fish found on one of the shallow reefs of Grand Cayman. The fish closest to the camera, only inches away, look huge, while others in the background look a fraction of the size, even though they are only a few inches farther away. To shoot this picture, we again set the lens to minimum focus distance and to f16, allowing the camera's TTL circuitry to control the strobe. So far, we've discussed shots that you can control almost in their entirety. But there will be some situations where controlling the action is impossible. A good example of this is in Stingray City in Grand Cayman's North Sound. Hi, welcome to Stingray City. Probably the best dive you're ever going to do in your life. Skin Diver calls it the best 12-foot dive in the world. And what we have around this area are a number of common southern stingrays. Anywhere from about a foot wide up to about four or five feet wide. And they're going to be banging into you, knocking into your heads, rubbing their bodies all over your body. And they're basically looking for food and to have their picture taken. This is probably the best spot in the world to do wide angle photography. <laughs> The action here is fast and furious, and you really have no control over the subject matter as these beautiful animals glide past you in search of a free meal. All that you can really do is ensure that your exposures will be correct, preset your distance to three to four feet, and wait until your subjects come within your depth of field. Perhaps the best advice when shooting in this situation is to shoot a lot of exposures and hope that the law of averages is on your side.
How you doing? Boy, that was great. How'd you enjoy it? Very nice? Oh, that was great. I couldn't believe all those stingrays. They it were really everywhere. Is the, the best 12 foot dive in the world. I think one of the greatest thrills of being an underwater photographer is being able to explore reefs all over the world, viewing firsthand the spectacular beauty they have to offer, and then sharing that excitement with your friends when you get back home through the pictures that you've taken. In the last few years, I've had the opportunity to travel to many places, seeing and photographing sites only a lucky few will ever see. In many of these locations, I was only able to capture the magnificence of the seascape through the very talents of the wide-angle lens. Here are a few of my favorite wide-angle shots from places that I've visited. Little Cayman, renowned for crystal clear waters, magnificent walls, and prolific marine life. Coco Island, Costa Rica, known for schooling hammerheads, white tips, and mantas. Sapadan Island, a paradise with huge numbers of turtles and schools of barracudas and jacks. And the Red Sea, alive with color and life and some of the finest photographic opportunities in the world. All great artists select from a vast array of brushes and palettes to create their masterpieces. The Nikona system with its varied and contrasting accessories, lenses and strobes allows you as an underwater photographer to produce a multitude of magnificent images. Over our series of tapes, we've discussed the equipment and techniques that will allow you to represent our underwater world the way that you see it. With time, if we practice the principles we've seen, underwater photography will become as great a passion for you as it has for me. So until next time, this is Martin Sutton at Fisheye in Grand Cayman wishing you great shooting. Don't go away, because coming right up is a special bonus section on how to direct underwater models. Fisheye's series of Nikonis instructional videotapes teach you how to shoot with the world's most popular underwater camera, the Nikonis 5. Leading you each step of the way in a simple, easy to follow manner, they have everything you'll need to become an expert in the exciting world of underwater photography. To order your copies of basic underwater photography with the Nikonis 5 or either of the advanced underwater photography tapes, call, write or fax to Fisheye, P.O. Box 30076, Grand Cayman, British West Indies. The basic tape costs just $24.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. The advanced tapes cost $29.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. For orders outside the United States, at $15 for shipping and handling. Send check, money order, or credit card information and order your tapes today. They just may be your best photographic tool. As you've seen in our series of tapes, the use of a model is often a vital and integral part of the shot. Whether it be one of the modeling portraits or one of the distant diver shots we've just seen. Working with models is not easy. It requires practice and patience. But by following a few pointers, we believe we can make that task easier. When choosing a dive model, you can always ask your dive buddy, but that's not necessarily the best choice. It's usually better to work with the same person all the time, however. That's why many times the dive model will be a husband or wife. It's not by accident that many of the world's great underwater photographers are part of a team using the same trusted model over and over again. When choosing a model, their ability to be a comfortable diver will often make or break your shot. Buoyancy control is just as important for the model as it is for the photographer. And for this reason, a novice diver is probably not the best choice for the shoot, no matter how enthusiastic. In the best of all worlds, you'd choose someone who's petite. Water magnifies. Things look bigger underwater. 
and a petite diver will tend to look normal in size. As much as your budget allows, you should try to make your model color coordinated. Begin with their wetsuit or dive skin. You are no longer limited to the drab blacks of previous days. Today's equipment has bright colors and looks, sleek with elegant stripes to accentuate body proportions in a variety of colors. I love the colors in this one. Mm -hmm. That'll look great underwater. We just have to find masks and fins to go with oh, it. Oh, this is perfect. I think that's even your size. Let's take it. OK. What about this one? Well, the pinks won't really match with that one, but this one would be a lot better. Oh, yeah. Many manufacturers now produce equipment in smaller sizes, proportioned even for the petite lady. One of the most important pieces of equipment is the face mask. Many shots, including divers, concentrate on eye contact between diver and primary subject. Most new masks, made from silicone, allow strobe light to penetrate through the mask skirt, allowing the photographer to light the model's face. Never use a black rubber mask on your model. Before the dive, you should consider going over some simple sign language with your model that will allow you to communicate underwater. This gets easier with practice. Hi, Sue. Hi, Martin. We're going to be using up, down, move to a more acute angle, or a flatter body angle, move back, move closer, and look here. OK? OK. Underwater, your model's features will tend to disappear unless they are highlighted using waterproof makeup. Your model should start with a good foundation makeup in a color that will flatter her features. The cheeks can be given a more rosy color with a good application of blush. The eyes will be behind the mask and must be accentuated. Begin by outlining the eyes with eyeliner to add emphasis. Coloring the eyes with eyeshadow in a color that will complement the color of the wardrobe will make the eyes stand out even further. And finally, underwater mascara will accentuate the lashes. Quick check, and we're ready to dive. Prior to leaving for the dive, you want to discuss the type of shots you're hoping to take with your model in as much detail as possible. Stick drawings often help to explain what he or she is expected to do, look like, and look at. The more discussion beforehand, the better you'll be able to communicate underwater. Okay, let's check your equipment before we go down. Make sure these are tight. Pull down. You're going to tight across here too. The overall appearance of the model should be neat and tidy. Consoles and octopuses should be stowed so as not to hang loose in your shots and, more importantly, not to dangle free and drag on the reef. Never forget that safety is our most important consideration. Although our model is posing for our shots, he or she should still be first a diver, able to help his or her buddy in problem situations and able to react themselves to problems. It may be perhaps most important that no shot is worth destroying the reef for. Both you and your model should attempt to practice photo buoyancy control.
great. Sue did a great job. Excellent. Thanks, Excellent. Sue. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. I always enjoy my length of fish out. <laughs> you see how all that planning worked? Yes. It really went smoothly. Made the shooting a lot easier. Don't forget that your model works hard to make your shots better. At the end of a photo session, you should remember to thank your model and discuss how some things worked and how others could have been improved. I try to give to my models copies of the images that we've shot together. I found that this often makes them want to work with me again. So here are the ones that we shot the other day. Martin, it's great. It looks really wonderful. It turned out really well. This is a good time to have a feedback session with your model, when you can both look at the finished shots and determine how you can improve your communication and poses. If you intend to publish your work, it's in your best interest to have your model sign a model release. Many publications require copies of such releases before they will publish your work. Many professional photo stores sell blank release contracts. Working with models underwater is never easy. However, the more you work with the same model, the easier your work will become. With practice, you'll find that the model instinctively moves into the right position, requiring only minor modifications on your part. Now that you've mastered working with one model underwater, you're ready for the next step, working with two. I'm Martin Sutton in Grand Cayman, wishing you great shots.